this week on Crossfeed. Are science and religion mutually exclusive? Church at the Comedy Club. The return of the Latin Mass. Is India's caste system really religious? Do church bells disturb the peace? Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of CrossFeed News. I am Pastor Jim Butler, back now in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome, everyone, after a little bit of a hiatus. A hiatus during my vacation, back to that glorious town known as Kansas City, where I never realized growing up they had quite the twang and as many rednecks as they do, but now I'm much more aware of it and sensitive to it. <laughs> well, I've been uh, batching it this week. Uh, my wife and oldest daughter are actually in Washington, D.C. right now uh, touring. They have been uh, touring with the uh, the Drum and Bugle Corps, and they've been to, let's see, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, um, Maryland, where they stayed last night, and so today they're in Washington, D.C., and then they're heading back to Iowa, uh, leaving tonight, and they'll be back uh, tomorrow night about uh, 7 o'clock, driving straight through. Okay. Now, of course, I, I've seen a drum, drum and bugle corps competition, and in my opinion, it's two and a half hours of halftime. Um. <laughs> they were in Boston last year. Biggest. Well, they'll be back here again. And if they do, then I'll have to go see them and then uh, visit with them a little bit. Yeah, and I'll have to go on that tour so that Jim and I can finally meet. That's right. We've never actually... We, we talk to each other face to face every week, but we've never actually met in person. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we actually got to know each other over a couple of internet lists. Um, yeah. First one dealing with Mac Mac computers, and uh, they all figured out from one of my posts that I had to be Lutheran. So uh, <laughs> it's like, this guy's got to be Lutheran. So, anyway. Speaking of Lutheran, let's start talking about the Catholics. Yeah, that sounds good. Power of the dark side. Of course, there are those Lutherans who think we should still stick with the German service every Sunday. Yeah. But uh, there are those Catholics who love their Latin Mass, and Pope Benedict said, okay, he's going to for, uh, allow for a wider use of it. I am not a committee! Now, this is kind of a part one, because the Pope released a document uh, it just came out, what, yesterday? Um, and, um, day before, some, sometime this week, yeah. Yeah, and this is actually a preview, this article was. Um, we'll cover the rest of that document next week because that's kind of a big story right now. But just because of the way the timing works, we tend to be just a little bit behind on the stories. And so we will cover that one next week. Um, but this first part is talking about the Latin Mass. Now, when I heard about this, I, I was at a meeting. I'm on our local food pantry um, board of directors, and um, also on that same board is the uh, head pastor at the local uh, Roman Catholic Church. And so I asked him about this. I said, what is the deal with the Latin Mass? You know, what? why do they want to bring it back? And, and he said, well, I'll tell you one thing. I'm not going to be doing it. <laughs> He said, for Latin, Latin? I have absolutely no desire to learn it. No. Oh, yeah. But you don't have to know Latin. You just have to memorize the stupid thing. That's true. No offense to our Roman Catholic traditionalist friends. Um, but it, interestingly, he said, you know, it took us uh, 400 years to get rid of it, um, and, and we were only able to get to the vernacular thanks to Martin Luther, which I thought was interesting. And, um, and he said, now they want to bring it back. Well, see, I live, or I should say we, live not too far from Dyersville, which is uh, best known for, uh, it's the movie site of the Field of Dreams movie, which that uh, baseball diamond is still there. You can go visit it for free and even play ball on it. But um, 
It's also known for, it has this huge double spire basilica. And they have a Latin mass every Sunday at noon. So he says, if anybody around here really wants to have a Latin mass, they can go to Dyersville anytime they want. And they've been having it there for a long time. So, so there's a, um, yeah, act, uh, there's a church yeah, about two miles from here maybe that has a Latin mass. As you drive by a little blue sign saying Latin mass this way. Uh, what's interesting about it is that the building where they hold their Latin Mass is St. Luke's original building. Really? Yeah, we moved here in 1960, and when um, the church moved, actually they sold the building to a a, a, Jew, a Reformed synagogue. Hmm. And the Reformed synagogue moved, and they turned around and sold it to this uh, Latin Mass group. Hmm. So uh, that's that's what's there. So I don't know what it is. There are certain people, though, real diehard traditionalists, who love this life. Uh, yeah. And just don't want to let it go for nothing. I, best known is probably Mel Gibson. Yep. Now yep. he, uh, yep. Fame isn't everything. The thing is, he said that there's a lot of younger people, like in their 20s, who really like the Latin Mass. And um, he said, really, the way he sees it, and this is his big concern is that they see that there's some sort of mystical something that makes doing it in Latin more spiritual or something. And he said, that's not the case. So, you know, if people are getting hung up on the this sort of experiential thing, um, that they think that there's something particular about this. He says, you know, they're totally missing the point, and they shouldn't even be doing it then. And which I thought was really insightful, and it's one of the reasons that he doesn't want to do it. He also just doesn't want to have to memorize it. But you know. uh, the reality is, though, he is right. Postmodern people are in very much into experience, very much into ritual, very much into liturgy, and that's different. I mean, I, I you know, I'm, I'm there at the tail end of the baby boom, and. Um, you know, we kind of were against all that. We were a little bit more into the, um, uh, the well, basically the praise service. I mean, that stuff, that was developed, really came out of the Jesus movement, um, you know, out in California, really pioneered by Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel. Which, by the way, we got an email from Cheryl, a member of Calvary Chapel, and a shout out to her and to her congregation then for that. Uh, but that that really came with us, and it's interesting then to see that my children, you know, saying no, we don't like um, that. We're more into this experiential, very traditional liturgical stuff. Yeah, there was an interesting comment in this article by uh, Marie Borg. No relation. Um, this uh, 80-year-old Italian said, uh, Celebrating the Mass the traditional way reminds us of the importance of religion and the authority of the Church, which is a good thing. And that, you know, something about that statement really struck me. She's talking about the authority of the Church. No, she didn't say the authority of the Word of God. And that is where most Protestants will vary from... Uh, from Roman Catholicism. And Eastern Orthodoxy would also put the emphasis of authority on the church as well. But, you know, we say, oh, the authority is in the word of God, not in the church. The, the word gives the church authority, but not the other way around. And so, and, and that's why we, you know, from Martin Luther on, have pushed for doing the services in the vernacular so that people can understand it because the whole point is to come and hear the Word of God. And if it's being said in a language that you don't understand, then it's completely pointless. And you might as well just be listening to gibberish. However, remember that in Luther's day, only certain parts of the service were in German. The majority of the service was still done in Latin. Yeah, that's 
Uh, that's important. Just parts of it were actually done in, in uh, uh, German. The whole service wasn't yet. That later on came with this Deutsche Messe, but a lot of the churches still did the service in Latin, which is parts of it in German. Uh, but then, well, that was a slow process. I mean, he couldn't change it all at once. He even, um, at first, was only doing communion in one kind because it was such an offense to people's consciences. So we, I think, need to... Um, I mean, it does come down to the question, though. I guess it's good for the diehard traditionalists, and maybe for the certain segment of the postmoderns who are into it. But how many people are really going to go there I mean, who are completely unchurched are going to go there and and draw something out of it. I mean, the purpose, you know, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess it comes to the question, what's the purpose of worship? But it's if unchurched people say one of the places they're going to come into to contact with Christians is going to be through the worship service. But it seems to me that whatever takes place in that worship service needs to touch their lives. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 t- talks about that whole thing. You know, what good does it do if you come into a service and everybody's speaking in tongues? You know, somebody's going to think you're all crazy. But if you mm-hmm. speak intelligibly, he will know he will be touched by the Spirit and he will realize that the power of God is among you. Oh, very nice, Blaine. So one of the I you know I, I asked him what's really the the driving force behind bringing this back. And he said, really, in a lot of ways, this is a political move. Because there was this guy back um, around Vatican II. Uh, his name was Lefebvre, the French uh, bishop. And he was very opposed to a lot of the um, the Vatican II reforms. And, and he was very much a, a, strong, a staunch traditionalist and very much in favor of the... Um, of the Latin Mass, and so he took a whole bunch of people with him, uh, a lot of French bishops and some others, and in fact, he ordained some people, and then the Pope excommunicated all of them. Well, the new Pope is trying to bring those people back in. He's trying to unite them again, and he's hoping that bringing this back will help, will be the first step in bringing those people back into the fold and and reuniting uh, the Roman Church. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, yeah, he meant that the article mentioned that. I, what I found interesting is, <laughs> is that one of the most secular, unchristian, immoral countries in the world, France, live half the Catholic fundamentalists. These real traditionalist guy people in the world, you know, I just thought it was really kind of an odd tie-in. But that might also then be part of his proclamation that he made this week, which we'll be talking about next week. Uh? Now, what if they did the Latin Mass in a comedy club? <laughs> <laughs> There's an image for you. Well, I mean, you know, I might work because there is a um, a church in uh, Hartford, Connecticut just uh, 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 or yeah, outside uh, Hartford um, <clears throat> and they're doing a uh, St. Paul's Collegiate Church which is a, po- it's interesting they don't call themselves a non-denominational but a post-denominational congregation um, mm-hmm. and That's they well, are from um, going to be starting a weekly service in the a comedy club called the Hartford Funny Bone, uh, which is located at the shops in Buckland Hills Mall, which, by the way, has a very nice Apple store um, <laughs> for all the Mac fans out there. I, I've been to Buckland Hills a couple of times. So there's two different places to worship in that mall. <laughs> That's right. The cult of Mac and, you know. And, and, and St. Paul's Although Collegiate they changed their name. Yeah, they, they changed their name. They're no longer St. Paul's Collegiate Church. Now they are Bethel, the church at Franklin Mills. No, that's a, another and the congregation. With an ellipse in there. That's a completely there different church. Oh, okay. My bad. Yeah, sorry. That, uh, 
That's a, uh, uh, Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. Uh, a Philadelphia church. Oh, right. In a, um, movie theater. Right, in, the, in this movie theater. But anyway, so I'm, um... I mean, I, 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 it was funny that they seem to think this is really weird, because I've known lots of churches to get started in, um... Funeral homes, gymnasiums, um, hotel rooms. Um, there was a matter of fact. There was a church. I, I, I one of the hotels we stayed in on vacation. Um, they had a church there on Sunday morning. Had a small sign in one of their ballrooms. My first congregation got started in a movie theater in the town. That's where they had held worship for for for, for a long time. Um, sure. So I didn't see this as being anything all that, you know, different. Other than that they're meeting on Monday night on uh, other night. I guess the comedy club's not open, really. But, you know, the mall is. And so you got all these people walking in and out through the mall. I thought that was kind of interesting. You're in this non-traditional time and really, in a, in a certain way, kind of a non-traditional place. Yeah. Well, there's some, um, like the Mall of America. Up in Minnesota, mm -hmm. they, there's a church in there, um, and uh, well, there's a lot of storefront churches, but a lot of the storefront churches are storefront churches because they just can't afford a building, so they're renting out the space in the strip mall or something like that. But these people are being very deliberate about being in this comedy club that's it, to make it more approachable. Now, it's important to note that. They're not, this is, the comedy club is not open as a comedy club during this time. It's not like pastors standing up there and um, firing off one-liners or something. They're using the space. And the idea is they wanted a non-traditional space, and they wanted to be in a place where that would seem more approachable to outsiders. You know, we've had other stories about churches that meet in, um, what was it, Jim Baker's son has the church in a bar. And, um, and uh, There's you know, one in Missouri that met like in that. The, the brew pub, I remember. Yeah, so, and, you know, we've talked about that. So, this isn't really that out there. Um, you know, it, it, initially it kind of sounds like, oh, they're... Um, they're turning worship into a stand-up comedy bit. That's not it. But it is important, I think, looking through the story, um, the need to take the word to where the people are going to hear it. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times I think a lot of churches kind of had this field of dreams mentality. If you build it, they will come. And so they built these buildings and kind of expected the people to show up. And a lot of times we still have that idea that we really expect them to, to come in. You know, and instead of thinking about how can we go out and where can we be. Right. Yeah. What's your evangelism program? We have a sign. That's right. You know, <laughs> um, and, which is not a bad thing, but, uh, you know... No, there is this the need for us always to go out and to make our faith to communicate it in innovative, clear, and understandable ways. Um, I'm now reading the book. Uh, I'll, I'll give the book a plug because I find it fascinating. I sold my soul on eBay uh, by he Himmet Meta, who is was raised uh, as. Uh, as a Jane, and uh, became an atheist, and um, put it as a, put up an offer on eBay that he would uh, attend church for uh, one hour for every ten dollars that people that. bid. And this is the guy. This is this. It's interesting. A, a book by an atheist, published by a Christian publisher, um, but he's wanting churches to be able to communicate their message well. And so I just got started getting into it and. Uh, why it's interesting because he thinks churches do something better than anybody any other organization. 
but he's got all these questions. And so he went to like 15 different churches and he kept uh, uh, and wrote on this uh, website about the uh, his experiences at them. And so this is he since then he was he's gone to even more. So it's just a very fascinating book. I've just gotten to like the first two or three chapters and but but he has a blog called friendlyatheist.com. And he, he he's anxious to dialogue with Christians and other religious people. Respectfully and kindly. But anyway, it just again that need that we go out um and that we do things carefully. He's, he's talking about the first church he went to was um St. Patrick's Church in Chicago, which was about, you know, half a block from where he lived. And he said, he sat there and he said, why are they standing? Why are they kneeling? Why are they doing this now? And that happened to him a lot of other churches, too. You know, well, why do they do what they're doing? And how do we get away from proclaiming the faith in, in trite ways? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. Yep, it's got to be approachable. Although, at the same time, I will make a plug for church architecture. Uh, Jim Wetstein, the guy that does the, uh, the On You Stay comic, and, um, and is, what well, is that, Valparaiso? Yes. Uh, he does, he also has, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, but he's, he's basically trained in church architecture. And, there's something to be said, when possible, um, for church architecture because um, there's a lot of symbolism that goes into it. Now, that symbolism isn't necessarily going to be readily apparent to an outsider. And so there's always that balance. Um, you know, and with, with anything that you do as a church, you need to be approachable. But at the same time, you can't make it so you can't dumb it down, you know? And so, so there's, there's always that, that balance between we want to, we want to feed the people and make sure that we're giving them what they need. Um, but at the same time, it needs to be, we need to reach a broad audience. So, you know, that's one of the challenges that pastors have in, in their preaching that we have to make the sermon, you know, make it soft enough that those who are very young in their faith, can chew it, um, but at the same time, um, make it meaty enough that the old veterans of the faith um, have something that fills them too. You know, sometimes I amaze even myself. But here's hoping that St. Paul's Collegiate Church has a successful ministry and reaches the lives of many people because that's really what it's all about. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. Dale's hacking and I'm sneezing. Anyway. <laughs> thank God for mute buttons. And thank God for mute buttons. You people don't have to hear it then. Uh, <laughs> but what if in the mall they had a bell to call the people to worship? Do you think that would work? I wish those bloody bells would stop. I don't think that would go over too well in a mall. Yeah, I think it would go. Of course, it didn't go over too well in New Zealand, either. No, it did not. Oh, it's quite nice, dear. It's Sunday. Uh, it's the there church. There was a church. Pray, uh, 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 um, St. Christopher's in Christ Church, New Zealand. And um, <clears throat> this bell had been rung every morning for 50 years for 33 seconds. And apparently, somebody complained about it being too loud. And temporarily, at least, it was shut down. What about us atheists? Why should we have to listen to that sectarian Back turmoil? Again. But yeah, they they shut it down. Basically, it's noise ordinances. They're saying, well, it's disturbing the peace. So, but then there was a follow-up story that they decided that it had existing use rights. And so, since they'd already been doing it for 50 years said, boy, it's, you know, it's kind of hard for us to come up with some law saying, oh, now all of a sudden you can't do it. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough call, though. Um, you know, you don't want to annoy the neighbors, but at the same time, um, it seems a shame if you have a, a tradition, and in this, you know, in this case, they ring it 33 times for the 33 years of the, um, who's it, pre- Crucifixion, resurrection, Jesus. Ah. And 
Um, so... If only we had some kind of missile! I don't know, we have a bell on our church that we rang before the service. Of course, our service is at 9. So, by then, you know, some people are still sleeping. But we've been around for much longer than uh, 50 years. Our church is over 100. And, uh, in fact, we just celebrated our 125th uh, a couple of years ago. So, you know, we, we have even more existing use rights. We also never had a complaint. Well, now, I my mean... last church up in Wisconsin, we got complaints there because there they had one of those uh, sort of recorded carillon kind of deals where mm-hmm. they played music. And um, it, it, was on a, it was all on an electronic timer and everything. Well, it didn't adjust itself automatically for daylight savings time. So you'd have to go in and do that every six months. And uh, one time I went up and adjusted it when it was time. And I accidentally only turned it like um, 11 hours instead of 23 hours. So all of a sudden the the noon <laughs> um, bell started going off at midnight. <laughs> Thankfully, I live next door to the church, and I heard it going off, and I went, ah, oops, <laughs> ran over to the church in my pajamas, <laughs> ran up into the steeple, and changed it quick. I would like to sing that. <laughs> well, thankfully, it was dark. <laughs> Pastor Dale running in his PJs through the church. You probably wouldn't like to see it. <laughs> um, I, I was reading this. Okay, I understand. But how about reading it ten times, one for each commandment? Or twelve times, one for each um, disciple? I mean, you know, the 33 is a little excessive, if you ask me. Uh, actually, it's not 33 bell rings, it's 33 seconds is how long that the, the ringing lasts. So, um, Well, the follow-up article says uh, it tolls 33 times. Okay. Once a second? That would really be annoying. Uh, because um, the, the first one says it's 33 seconds, so I'm not sure exact. I don't know how it would work out, but, you know, I don't know. It's, it's, it is hard because you don't want to annoy the neighbors. You you want to um, get along with them. You want to be, you know, kind. I, I, I wasn't real happy with this uh, Archdeacon's comment in the first article where he says uh, if he bought a house next to a school, he'd expect the noise from children. So if you buy a house next to a church, you got to expect the bells. Yeah, you know, it's basically, that's the brakes, buddy. Put up with it. Close the window! I'm not sure. It's not going to, yeah, it's not going to go over real well. Yeah, I, I you know, my first church, uh, we had an interesting, we, we had some neighbors that didn't like us being there very much. Uh, and we owned all, all this land. And um, we wanted to we rezoned part of it for something we were looking at doing. And so the, the town came to us and said, you know, you guys have a, a special zoning here. Would you mind rezoning all your property, not as part of it? And we said, sure, no problem. What does it need to be zoned? He said, oh, it needs to be zoned as an office. Because that's the only thing we can think to put you guys under. Fine. Yeah. Well, we had neighbors saying that we were planning on building an office park back there. <laughs> because we were zoning an office, we kept thinking, no, we're not zoning an office. The town asked us to do this. They're, they're the, you know, um, you know, they're the ones who put us under the office zoning. You know, we, we're actually, we're actually looking at uh, developing a um, nursing home center back there, a retirement center back along the river. And uh, it was just like trying to figure, you know, get these people convinced that this is not what we're, this is not what we're talking about doing. You know, and ay yeah, yeah, it was like pulling yeah. hair. Uh, but trying to get along with the neighbors can be a little tricky sometimes. Those bells are getting louder! Yeah, so, it's a, you know, it's a tricky thing. You don't want to upset the neighbors, but at the same time, you know, you need to discuss these things and try to work out some kind of, uh, you know, agreement. And, you know, there's, you've got this mother who had complained um, about six months ago that the noise, it was waking up her kids. 
love the quote. Another seemed a bit insensitive to me. I would have thought that if your children were sleeping through to 7.45 a.m., you'd be happy. <laughs> Not if they're up late the night before. I don't think you're happy enough. I don't. You know, so far it almost sounds like a joke, you know. Uh, a, 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 a Latin a church doing a Latin mass in a mall with a bell. <laughs> But I can't think of how to add any of the other stuff we're going to, because... <sighs> Let's go to dealing with science here. Well, this is interesting, because, you know, the psalm writer says, um, you know, Ray, uh, uh, Ray, raise the children in the way that they should go, and when they are, part, when they are, when they are adults, they will not depart from it. And that's what this article on science basically are scientists are basically arguing, saying that the a lot of these scientists that they interviewed, if they were raised as believers, tended to remain believers. Uh, but if they were not, they tended not to be. I did not know that. Yeah, this doesn't really surprise me. I mean, when you consider the fact uh, how influential religious beliefs can be in a person's life, I mean, you know, that's your whole worldview. That's the way that you perceive reality and so when you study science whatever your worldview is whether it's religious or um or, or non-religious that's your your understanding of science is going to be uh, it's it's going to be in that same context of how you understand the world and i mean you know you look throughout history there are plenty of very religious scientists, and in fact, most of the scientists that we look to today throughout history were, in fact, Christians. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got Newton, Galileo, uh, who ran into some trouble with the church, but really had, you know, he ran into trouble with the church because he was a Christian and um, was going against what they were trying to do. Um, you have Copernicus, who was Lutheran. Um, Mendel, you know, yep, Gregor Mendel, who's a monk, you know, I mean, and the list goes on. And so there's no reason really to think that a lot of scientific knowledge is going to affect a person's religion's beliefs, especially when you consider the fact, you know, who believe that the Bible is true. All right. Well, Consequently, I'm going to expect that what I find in the scientific evidence is going to support what I understand from the Bible. And now it's important that when you go through it, uh, when you study the evidence, that you don't throw away anything that doesn't fit into your worldview, because that's not honest science. But you know, the same thing, same goes if you're an atheist that if you find something that doesn't fit into your worldview, that, you know, you at least need to study it more, look for more evidence, whatever. But ultimately, the what you're, you know, generally, as much as possible, you're going to try to interpret the evidence based on your worldview. And that's just reality. Everybody has a bias. Right. And... Until some evidence comes along that contradicts your worldview, you're going to keep on believing what you believe. My first, my vicarage church, we had a couple geologists, we had um, a nuclear physicist, we had a chemist. You know, we had some people who were in hard to hard sciences, but they were, you know, all pretty committed Christians. That was, you know. They weren't, were not, I'm sure you would not like to hear, but uh, young earth creationists, uh, they, they uh, uh, just couldn't buy that. Uh, though they, the, 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 the geologist, who also happened to be one of our elders, uh, told me, he said, I see God's footprints. Yeah, I see God's footprints in, 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 in the world and how he created it. Uh, so, then, you know, which I thought was kind of an interesting little picture there. Uh so I, what I found interesting about this is that 15% of the, the people they, they interviewed were Jewish. Impressive. 
which mm-hmm. was way over the the national norm. Yeah. Yeah, the national norm's like two percent. Yeah. Which way. you wouldn't know. That that's I mean that's a, a little news item right there. That only two percent of the general population of this would be um this is worldwide, isn't it? No, this I'm is sure. American. Oh, it's just, oh yeah, you're right, you're right. It's American. Two um, percent of the religious general population is Jewish. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even less than but, that. Yeah. I mean, the, you always think of Judaism as being this major world religion. It's not. It's just a very vocal world religion. So it's nothing against Jews or anything. It's just the reality. Right. Know? But I just found it interesting that uh, that that big of a a percentage of the people, the scientists they interviewed. Of course, their, their ideas were were pretty wide ranging when it came to what they you know considered uh, a scientist because uh, it was um, yeah, it was Physics, the hard chemistry, sciences. biology, sociology, economics, political science, psychology, and other fields. Right. So they wouldn't consider theology in there. Well, uh, Although, but I'm going to tell you something. A, a, physicist, theology. Yeah. a physicist or a chemist is not going to consider a sociologist or a psychologist or a political scientist to be a science scientist. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think the fact that they, you know, dealt in with the, the social fields, sociology and economics and political science and psychology, uh, throws it off, throws their survey off. Because those people are not scientists. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it would be interesting to to see a bit more of a breakdown as far as the various fields. Um, of course, as someone who has a bachelor's in psychology, um, I have to take offense at that. <laughs> not that I really learned anything um, useful or valuable except for a few sermon illustrations. Um, I think I, I got more out of my um, theater degree than I did. But, but you know, you look at it though, and and and, and um, but that may be why there's such you know, it's fifty over fifty percent of the people saw themselves as secular, but sociologists, um, you know, sociology is an overwhelmingly secular field. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't met too many Christian sociologists. Um, no offense, but there, you know, just tends not to be that many. Um, uh, and the same thing in uh, uh, within a, a lot of psychological schools. A lot of them are not only not Christian, but actively, you know, non-Christian. I know the University of Massachusetts. I had a friend of mine uh, going to the uh, working on a degree in psychology, and you know, some of the people are going, "What in the world is this preacher doing in this program?" We don't serve their kind here. Yeah, uh, it was just you know, just just almost treated with disdain by. Uh, some of the, particularly the newer students. He was pretty far along in his PhD, and the people who knew him thought he was actually pretty good. But you get these newer graduate students, and they would just treat him with disdain. Well, you know, for that matter, um, it's hard to get a job in a major university if you are uh, a Christian and um, you know vocal about being a Christian. I was listening to a presentation. It was actually a guy from Answers in Genesis, speaking of young earth creation. Um, he's a Missouri Senate Lutheran and a professor at uh, Washington University, which we'll mention later, too. Um, oh, wait, never mind. That's something else I was thinking of. But, um, yeah, down in St. Louis. And and he said, um, yeah, there, there's Christians at WashU. Uh, in the janitorial department, and uh, <laughs> but he said it uh, generally seemed like he was the only actual faculty uh, that was Christian. He may have been unaware of a few, but the overwhelming uh, number were not uh, Christian. So, but you know, people point to that and say, "Well, see, look at the um, you just don't have." a lot of people that are you know, qualified or whatever. But there are also those who would say, well, is it that? Or is it a bias in hiring practices? And from some of the bias that I saw in my 
college professors at Madison, I could very well imagine, well, they couldn't, you know, not hire somebody because of their religious beliefs. I mean, that's illegal. Um, at the same time, you know, they say, well, you don't have a very scientific approach or, you know, or something like that and say, you know, there are other, there are ways of getting around uh, religious discrimination and still doing it. I mean, good luck if you're a younger creationist getting a job as a, in, in most of these sciences, uh, in a major university. Right. And by the way, that's important, I think, to note that this survey was done with scientists at research universities. So this would be MIT and mm-hmm. places like that. Um, as opposed to people who are working uh, in the pharmaceutical industry um, and other uh, and, and uh, or or in uh, engineering or in uh, for petrochemicals, so I mean, there's guys out there who've got degrees all over the place who aren't in universities who may have a very different approach than than these guys than, than this set. I mean, this this unfortunately it, it, it's it's just the sample they took, being out of research universities, and the broadness of it, I think, skews a little bit might, what might be the reality. Right. You know. Not only that, there's another interesting statistic. I say that past three times. Um, they, they found that 14% of the general population described themselves as evangelical or fundamentalist, but less than 2% of scientists identified themselves as either of these. And, um, you know, I, I look at that and I said, okay, what does this mean? I would think that a large proportion of evangelical and fundamentalist scientists are going to go and get jobs at Christian universities that would not be considered research universities, but they're going to go where they can actually teach according to what they believe. Did I make it clear that your job is at stake? But they did say younger scientists were more likely to believe in God and attend religious services than older scientists. So that was kind of interesting. They said if these young and religious scientists continue to stay religious, it could indicate an overall shift in attitudes toward religion among those in the academy. So I guess it depends on the validity of the step. Right. Well, again... You could have the, the evangelicals and the fundamentalists going um, to teach at Christian universities. You could also have them working for Pfizer mm-hmm. or, or some other corporation, you know, where right. they don't really care too much uh, about about your faith, just as long as you do the work. Uh, and mm-hmm. a lot of those biases won't be there. And then let's finish up. Uh, we've gone to New Zealand. Let's go to India. Now, now, I need to preface this article that this isn't actually a news story per se. It's actually a letter to the editor sent to the Washington Post. But I submitted this one, and it actually was a very popular story on our site, which is basically the criteria that I use for choosing stories is I look at the most popular stories. And um, and then I look at, okay, have we talked about something similar to this very recently? Then I might skip it. Or um, is how interesting is it going to be to actually talk about this? Um, this one was pretty popular, and um, and I, I thought it was also worth, um, worth noting because I thought the, there was probably more information here than – what was in the original article. Because we've talked about the Dalits before in India and the problems with um, the, how horribly they're treated and it tends to, they tend to go and um, convert to other religions or something like that just to be treated better. And the argument has always been that while well, this is a um, this is a religious thing, and it's all based in Hinduism. Well, this um, person that wrote into um, based on this seems to know a little bit about Hinduism and has an interesting insight. And she says, "I'm not sure." Um, the article quoted 
um, Chandra Prasad, a Dalit writer and expert on India's case system, as saying that it's worse than the Jim Crow laws were in, American, were in the American South because it's completely sanctioned by religion. She says, I'm not sure what part of the caste system um, Ms. Prasad believes is sanctioned by religion, while the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu uh, holy book, uh, mentions four varnas, or castes. According to one's qualities and characteristics, the caste system was originally designed to promote harmonious workings of society. The Gita does not say that a person's caste is determined by their birth, but rather by their behavior. So, whereas now, the whole system that they have is based completely on your birth. And you cannot transcend that. You can't move up or down in that system. It's completely based on who you were born to. I will bring you home. Well, I, I, I had to wonder, reading this letter, what cast he would have been part of. Because, you know, this Pr- Pr- Ms. Prasad was herself a Dalit. And so she herself would be experiencing the prejudice that's there. And she could probably sit back and see where it's, she sees it taught within the religion. I mean, to use a, I don't know, maybe it's not the best example, but, uh, you know, a lot of people see Christianity as a patriarchal religion. That represses women. <laughs> Reality is, if you look at scripture, it's just the opposite. It talks about men and women being equal. Jesus' ministry with women was, in relationship with women, was revolutionary for his day. I mean, he taught women. He encouraged them. They were part of his ministry. Even the words of Paul, where he talks about women being silent in the church and, and learning in submission. Well, if you know anything about how a rabbi teaches his disciples, you'd realize what Paul's saying is the women were supposed to teach, learn just like the men were. Because I mean, that's how the men were supposed to learn, quietly and in submission. I mean, that, that's part of being a, a, a disciple and hearing your rabbi. I mean, that's just part of the, the reality there. And so, but people, through their experiences, and I've been in churches where women were treated as second-class citizens. Um, you know, go, go, you know, pray, pay, and obey, uh, or go out and make coffee in the kitchen, uh, while the men do the work here, uh, can then associate, you know, and say, this is how the church teaches women, treats women. Well, it's not really what the Bible says, but it's how things have grown up around it since. And how we've allowed our culture to affect what Scripture says. And I think it could be the same situation here. Okay, maybe maybe uh, 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 the, the Gita doesn't say this. But here's the reality of how it's being used. And the guy himself, by the way, says, That being said, <laughs> this is what has happened since. So it's almost, in his argument, an abuse of Hinduism. Right. Yeah, he says the higher castes, like the Brahmins, who, according to the religion, are supposed to be the ones who are the very moral, very, you know, very good people. Um, that says they sought to maintain power by not allowing members of lower castes to move up. So it's, it's really, it's reversed the whole principle behind their system. And the system was to, it was basically designed to encourage people to be good people to so that they could move up in in levels and but instead it's it's worked just exactly the opposite that it's it's ended up suppressing um or repressing the the people who are who are trying to to be good and it's giving power to those who are self-absorbed right which is always but whoever's in charge always wants to remain in charge. Right. And will do whatever that they need to to remain in charge. Anybody looking at just American politics can figure that out. You know, yeah, that's why communism doesn't work. That's right. I mean, it's just, just reality. Because the whole point of communism is to, you're supposed to distribute everything 
And then those who are in power are supposed to end up as equals with everybody else. Right. But as George Uh, Orwell pointed out, all animals are equal. Some are just more equal than others. A very nice brain. Yeah, that's a that great statement. I had one question here, though, in this, this letter that really kind of confused me. He said, uh, there is nothing in Hinduism to compel anyone to remain a Hindu. If you want to convert, go ahead. Doesn't doesn't bother anybody. But yet we've come across all these stories mm-hmm. um, about in, 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 in a lot of them out of Indian papers. I mean, it's not like it's, you know, some, you know, Christian, you know, see how the people are being martyred group. I mean, a lot of them are out of Indian papers and talks about how, you know, these people who have converted out of Hinduism are being forced to reconvert back into it. Yeah, yeah, they're not allowed to. So, yeah, that's also part of Hinduism is that you're, it's not supposed to force the religion on anybody, but guess what it does? You know, and it, Christianity, of course, is the same way um, that Jesus never forced anything on anybody um, and Christians are not supposed to force their faith on them although there have been times in history when that has happened right those people that did that were raw dead raw because you can't force faith on anybody at best you can um, you can persecute them so that they pretend to have faith in fact um, Nostradamus the poet who claimed to be able to predict the future um, he was actually Jewish. Nostradamus is Latin for Our Lady. And um, the it, his Jewish family changed their name during the Spanish Inquisition to say, no, 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 we're, we're not Jewish. We're, we're good Catholics. We, are, are, we even have a good Catholic name. Yep. Well, who knows? I'm not an expert on Hinduism, and neither are you, and who knows what's no. really going to come there. But it was an interesting interesting perspective, although different from what we've heard in the past. And I enjoyed nope. reading it for that reason. There is a message for you. Once again, shout out there to Cheryl out on the West Coast, who said she came across our podcast and has been listening to us. And also to our friend Jeff, who we heard from again, and sent us a picture of... Uh, the cathedral there in um, New Orleans in Jackson Square, and it's yeah. been by there several times. I'd like to um, just, I, I thought this was a nice letter from Cheryl. Um, she says, "Hello, pastors here in Southern California. My husband and I are always looking for interesting programs to listen to via internet, since we don't have television by choice. And recently came across your site. Yeah, we're more interested than anything on TV anyway, right?" <laughs> um, we're enjoying your programs. I appreciate your relaxed conversational approach. I read the one review on iTunes and would have liked to leave my, one myself, but it did not seem to go through. It figures. We finally get a good review and it doesn't take. Cheryl, try again. Hopefully it'll work the second time. Sometimes there's a delay, but I've been checking and it's not showing up. So, um, yeah, if you want to try again, and for any, anybody else for that matter, um, we'd love a, a couple of reviews and that positive negative doesn't matter as long as you're honest but um, so and uh, she says uh, Mr. Idaho Doc is the other person that left a review should look elsewhere if he wants hard hitting hermeneutics and intensive exegesis there's plenty of that on the net already we appreciate your relaxed conversational approach at least you look and sound relaxed um, it's different and enjoyable to listen to we're not Lutheran Calvary Chapel as I mentioned before um, but enjoy and appreciate your perspectives. Thanks for the show. And um, so, Cheryl, thanks for your letter. And, I, you know, she brought up this uh, this whole issue of, of relax. And this is something that, um, that I, I've always kind of debated about. You know, how should I dress? Because since we're doing this thing on video, you know, how do I dress? And, um, and I usually am wearing a T-shirt or a sweatshirt when we do this. Um, Jim's usually not because you've got stuff going on at church right before this. So, um, but it's, you know, this is something that, that I've debated about. Like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm, can, we're doing the show as pastors, but at the same time, um, you know, a lot of what we're doing is not really official. So, appreciate the note. 
And then uh, from Jeff, <laughs> this is funny, Beth, Pastor Dakota, Jim, and Pastor Echo, <laughs> Dale, because <laughs> apologies to anybody that listened to that last show. That was, uh, not, we're not sure what happened, but uh, thankfully it seems that it seems to take care of itself. But anyway, the name of the cathedral in New Orleans is St. Louis Cathedral in Jackson Square, as I mentioned. Uh, I have a few cousins that live in the area of New Orleans, and I was there for a funeral this May. I've included a picture of the cathedral, and for those who are watching the video, uh, I will put that into the during the, the little closing thing so you can see the picture. Thanks, Jeff. And he says, you have to wonder when a huge church like the one in Barcelona is built, and it's more of a tourist attraction than a place of worship, is it edifying God or man? That's a good question. Impressive. Um, said, my understanding is that God's people worshiping him is the church, not a building. Very good. And on your talk about pastors, it says, my children went to an ELCA grammar school, Christ Lutheran, and on occasion we went to the services at this church. The senior pastor was pretty much in line with the teachings of the ELCMS, but the junior pastor was like what you were describing about the ELCA pastors you've come across. This is about five to seven years ago. I think the ELCA is getting more and more liberal as the more conservative pastors are retiring. Good pastors are hard to find. I've been on call committees at two different churches, and it's quite a process, and it takes a couple of years to replace a pastor. It depends on the church, and you um, kind of never know how long it's going to take. But uh, it says, thank you for your service to God and your congregations and sharing yourselves with us, your extended flock. Do you appreciate it? So, and Jeff, we appreciate that. Right. And then finally, how do you feel about women pastors? I know that the LCMF stand is not to ordain women, but I also heard that there were women acting as pastors in Europe during World War II. Jim, have you heard anything about that? No, but uh, I do know that in communist countries, women were serving as pastors because a lot of the men didn't want to because they were afraid of persecution. Hmm. Um, that, okay. uh, we had a guy up here who was sent by the Senate over to check out some of the, you know, just as communism was ending. And that was one of the questions he was like, is, are we're going to tell these women they're fired now? You know, a lot of them are serving very faithfully because the men wouldn't do it. Hmm. It's interesting. Well, and that... Uh, if, you, if you think of the... Was it the church of Lithuania? Vargas is the archbishop? Uh, the one your church... You, you got, or Latvia, the one you guys are working with. And that's why they had women pastors. It's because none of the men would. I didn't know they had women pastors. They did at was one it, time. In the past? Yeah, in oh, the past. They don't now, though. No. Well, they're, they're no longer allowing them to be ordained. Vargas said no longer. Now, now I guess they have men. But that was that was, that was was the reason, though, women had been ordained to that denomination, that church body. Uh, he said, uh, what happens when men won't step up for the calling and women want to? I think this will make an interesting discussion. I myself feel uncomfortable with a woman pastor. But on, on the other hand, wasn't Moses and Jacob's wife shepherdesses? Now, there's a difference between a shepherdess and... A pastor S. Um, the Bible doesn't forbid women shepherds. It does um, forbid women pastors. Right. However, I, 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 I'm going to go out on a limb here because I am sorry, Synod. But, you know, if. And, I, and I've got good. I, and and uh, if anybody happens out there, you know, Missouri Synod, Bob Poise agreed with me on this. That if the. Um, Men will not serve. Um, then he thought it was it was appropriate, you know, in, emer in any, very much an emergency situation again, such as existed under communism, that women could be ordained. Uh, he felt, you know, the men would not do it. Then, you know, somebody has to do it, and uh, you know, so he. Uh, uh, and so he, he said it should not not be done. He was, you know, but somebody has to fill the office. If none of the men will, then somebody has to. But I think of course, the other concern with that is that um, you end up with kind of what, what most churches have nowadays with Sunday schools, that it becomes all women teaching or the majority <laughs> being women teaching. And I've got nothing, about, nothing against women as Sunday school teachers. But it becomes seen as a women's job. Right. And um, 
And, and that's, I mean, that's the, the biggest danger besides the whole theological discussion, because I do believe that the Bible does forbid women pastors. What do you do in a situation where that's your only option? You know, that's a tough call. Right. And, it, it was, but, <laughs> or a situation up here at a, in a town in Connecticut, uh, a United Church of Christ congregation, the previous pastor was um, a Unitarian deist who uh, was a strong supporter of the Sandinistas. Hmm. And uh, so he left and uh, was replaced by a, a woman who was an evangelical, matter of fact, a graduate of Gordon-Conwell. And uh, so I said, I remember sitting back going, okay, so which is a man who is a deist or a woman who is an evangelical. <laughs> God doesn't want either one of them there. Which <laughs> but it was interesting. I, I actually had other pastors argue that the man was more appropriate because he was male, even though he was a deist. Wow. I'm like, I, I just like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, you know, she, she, she was, she, she was, you know, quite evangelical listening to talk and, and, and stuff. And it was just, you know, I thought it was an interesting situation, kind of almost the same one like this. I mean, uh, but, um, but I know, under, I think under communism, you know, the men were, the, the women would be treated lighter than the men. You know, they weren't being quite the hunted down and things. I'm not quite sure, but I, you know, I do know that's how it came about there in Latvia. But mm -hmm. after the free, the, the, the end of communism, Many men have begun to step up to become pastors. Um, and, of course, there were those male pastors who continued to serve despite the persecution. And yeah. um, so that's why, why uh, Archbishop Vargas then said no more. And uh, So we welcome other people's thoughts yep. on this topic or any of the other topics we've discussed. You can get a hold of us by calling our voicemail line at 206-350-4749. Or you can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or you, if you're watching the video of the feed in iTunes, you can just click on the screen. And, uh, which is what, uh, what Cheryl did or, um, or else she went to our website, but, uh, that'll take you to the feedback page that Cheryl used to get a hold of us. And uh, so we also want to thank our sponsor, PDAPerformance.com. They provide all of our hosting and bandwidth. And um, very soon I'm hoping to move us to a different server, which does mean the site might be down hopefully not very long. Maximum, I'd say, about 40, uh, 48 hours. It shouldn't be that long, though. Um, hopefully within the next month or two, definitely by the end of the summer. Um, and... So if, if anybody's had problems with stuff timing out on them, um, I'm going to move the site to a different server so that we won't have those problems anymore. So. Uh, what, one last shout-out from me to the folks at Biffle's Barbecue in Concordia, Missouri. Awesome place to eat. Some of the best barbecue huh. you'd ever want. Lutheran content. They are Lutheran. Um... And uh, right next to where I used to go to school, St. Paul's College, St. Paul's Lutheran High School in Concordia, Missouri. Uh, but just some great barbecue there. Oh, I want to mention one more thing. Um, this is something my, the other podcast that I do with my wife, uh, although lately I've been doing it with my six-year-old daughter because my wife's been gone so much, um, Tech Talk for Families. We're doing a contest, um, or, or we're participating in a contest, actually. Um, but... All of you as, as our CrossFeed listeners can also get in on this. Um, we are, if we win the podcaster part of it, one of the people that signed up with our promo code will win a free video iPod. Jim, you're eligible for this too. You were the chosen one. And so if you, if you, we're going to win the contest right now, we're like, um, 170 points ahead of the next person and um and there's with no sign of stopping um because besides getting points for people that sign up 
Um, if there's, uh, we also get points for making YouTube videos promoting this company, Podcast Ready, that makes uh, pod, uh, podcast software for um, various MP3 players and stuff. And uh, I've been cranking out YouTube videos like two or three a night. And uh, <laughs> so, in fact, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to watch the YouTube videos I've been making. Uh, I'll warn you that some of them, like last night I did one um, that I used the Batman Begins trailer. Um, I did my best one. It's uh, it's called Community, and it's um, it's a uh, I used a parody or I used a, a trailer from a kung fu movie, and added my own subtitles in. And that one was probably the best one. But it's kind of violent because it's a kung fu movie. So um, so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to check it out. But um, so I'll let you know about that so you can get it on if you want to get in on the contest to win a free iPod. There's no, uh, you, you have to sign up at this website, but there's no commitments or, you know, credit card or, you know, anything like that. They're not going to spam you or anything. So I want to mention that too. And that's all I have for tonight. Everybody take care and we will see you next week. God bless your weekend. Good night, everybody. God bless.